Good day, everyone. In this video lecture, I will present the overall idea and the key concepts of Iliade's seminal work titled The Sacred and the Profane, The Nature of Religion. As you can see, I wrote my summary, my notes on this topic, on the sacred and the profane. And so what I will do is I will just read my notes, my summary, and then do some side discussions if necessary. And so before we dive into the discussion, let me talk very briefly about Iliadis' background and famous works. Mercia, or some scholars call him Mercia, Iliadi was born in Romania in 1907. He was one of the most influential scholars of, of, of comparative religion in the 20th century. Iliadi loves to study ancient religious practices, which he called archaic religion, and spent his life promoting the field of the history of religion or comparative religion. As a historian of religion, Iliadi observes that even people today who proclaim themselves residents of a completely profane world are still unconsciously nourished by the memory of the sacreds. As I will show later, um, Iliadi argues that whatever your religious background, or even if you're an atheist, we cannot escape um, the experience of something luminous, the experience of something mysterious. Because as I will show later again, um, for Iliade, human beings are inherently religious in themselves. And so in other words, for Iliade, while contemporary people believe the world is entirely profane or secular, they still at times find themselves connected unconsciously to the memory of something sacred. And it is interesting to note that it is this very idea that both first drive Iliade's exhaustive exploration of the sacred as it has manifested in space, time, nature, and cosmos in life itself. And second, underpins his expansive view of the human experience. It is also very, it is also this very idea that inspires Iliade to write about the two modes of being in the world. That is, one being sacred on the one hand and being the profane on the other hand. It must also be noted that Iliade advocates, advocates for the merits of maintaining religious practice and belief in a secular world. Iliade is a sacred and the profane is a book of great scholarship and originality. In fact, it serves as an excellent introduction to the history of religion, but its perspective also encompasses philosophical anthropology or philosophy of demon person phenomenology and psychology. The book traces manifestations of these sacred uh, from primitive to modern times in terms of space, time, nature, and the cosmos as a whole. In doing so, he shows how the total human experience of, of the religious person compares with that of the non-religious. Indeed, the sacred and the profane illustrates Eliade's views on what it means to be religious. So much for a brief background of Eliade's and his work. In what follows, I will sketch very briefly, again, the overall idea and key concepts of his seminal work on the meaning, nature, and dynamics of religion. And so, as you can see, I will only focus on the most important parts or the most important aspects of Iliadis, uh, the sacred and the profane. So for the basis of our quiz on this topic, you need to review or study the chapter by chapter summary of this book that I uploaded in Modo. 
let me continue or let me begin now with uh, the key concepts of his similar work of this similar work Iliade begins by describing a binary view of the sacred and the profane or the religious and the secular drawing clear differences between homo religiosus and non-religious people but it must be noted that by the ends of the book he blurs the bright line between these two and he finishes by promoting a vastly inclusive understanding of what it means to be a religious person and what it means to be humans. So if you look at the trajectory of the book, although at first glance we can sense or we can see that the discussion focuses more on the difference between the binary opposition between the sacred and the profane but again as I already mentioned as we can see towards the end of the book the the trajectory ends with you know this intention of of Iliade to to for for us to understand you know to explain for uh, to explain and for us to understand what it means to be human and what it means to be a religious person and so Iliadis, the sacred and the profane, revises the meaning of the words sacred and religious. And so Iliadi rethinks, you know, the idea of the concept of sacred and religious, which is critical to the modern study of religion and has had a strong influence on our understanding of how religion and humanity intersect. Now Crucial to the understanding of Iliadis, the sacred and the profane are three categories, namely, first, the sacred, the, the sacred second, hierophany, and third, homo, the concept of homo religiosus. For Iliade, the sacred is something that causes one to stop and take notice, just as Moses stopped when he saw the burning bush. Iliade writes, Man becomes aware of the sacred because it manifests itself, shows itself as something wholly different from the profane. So if the sacred is something that causes one to stop and take notice, in other words, something that causes us to gaze in awe and wonder, the profane, on the other hand, is the homogeneity of the normal, quotidian mundaneness. So in other words, the profane is that banal reality, that banal existence. When it comes to life, for example, a profane life is an ordinary life. There's nothing mysterious in it. There's nothing extraordinary in it. While the sacred, on the other hand, is, as I mentioned already, uh, and as I will show later, there is uh, what we call the experience of the nominus, the experience, uh, the experience of something mysterious, something awe-inspiring. Okay? And again, on the other hand, the profane is that something you know, that is banal, mundane, quotidian, ordinary. More importantly, Iliade uses the term sacred to refer to transcendent being or beings like the gods or God. And this explains why Iliadi also argues that the sacred is the ultimate cause of all real existence. Okay. And so, well, as, as we can see here, the sacreds could also mean God, you know, the transcendent being. The term hierophany refers to the breakthrough of the sacred into human experience. In other words, hierophany is the revelation or the unconcealment of the sacred to humans or the manifestation of the divine. So um, if you're familiar with the philosophy of Martin Heidegger, if you're familiar with Martin Heidegger, we have in Heidegger's philosophy the idea of the unconcealment of being. Now, of course, Heidegger is not a believer. He's not uh, um, talking about um, philosophy of God here. But in that idea of the unconcealment of being, you know, um, being always reveals itself to us. Just like the sacred, for example, reveals itself to us. You know, and, and as I will show later, um, what 
differentiate hierophany from theophany is that in the, in the case of the former, in the case of hierophany, there is an awareness of on the parts of the human person, of the homo religious religiouses in terms of the unconsumabilities of, of this being. So the unconcealment of being, the unconcealment of the divine or revelation in general terms is what Iliade refers to as the sacred. For Iliade, the term hierophany is broader than the more familiar term theophany because it allows non-personal forms of the divine to become manifest. So again, when I say theophany, this refers to the idea that everything in nature is a manifestation of the divine. And that's it. Hierophany, on the other hand, two things which you know make it different from theophany is the idea that in hierophany, there is this unconcealment of the non-personal forms of the divine the manifestation of the non-personal forms of, of the divine. And second is the idea that in hierophany, the human person is aware of the unconcealment of being, is aware of the manifestation of the divine. Okay? So as I wrote here, we should not miss to consider the fact that for Iliade, hierophany does not only involve the manifestation of the divine, but also of humans' awareness of the divine, of the sacred, the moments the latter reveals itself to the former. So hierophany involves two things, the unconcealment of being or the manifestation of the divine or the, 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 the revelation of something mysterious, supernatural, and at the same time, the awareness of the, 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 the homo religiosus, the awareness of the human person of the said unconcealment or revelation. For Iliade, the sacred can manifest itself through different parts or mediums of the physical world, such as forests, um, rivers, mountains, stones, and the like. And so um, that is why um, in, in religion, sometimes the rocks, the stones, the trees, rivers, all these things that we can see in the universe, in the world, can be mediums for the manifestation of, of the divine. Homo religious, uh, the term homo religiosus refers to the being who is prepared already to appreciate and make sense of the hierophany of the manifestation of the divine. So uh, the homo religious, the homo religious is the person or the being who is aware of the unconcealment of being, who becomes aware of the manifestation of the divine. As homo religiosus, therefore, for Eliade, human beings are inherently religious. So as I mentioned before, uh, even if, you know, um, um, all of us, all human beings are, are inherently religious. Uh, even if one is a non-believer or an atheist, again, that person, all of us, cannot escape the reality or the fact that once in a while, we experience something nominous, we experience something supernatural, we experience something extraordinary or inspiring reality or inspiring events. But for Iliade, this inherent religiosity does not refer to a person's creedal beliefs or institutional commitments per se, but to our existential drive toward transcendence, freedom, and meaning making, no matter the differences of religious or a religious backgrounds, orientations, or convictions. So in addition to the idea that we can escape that experience of the nominals, Iliade is also saying that that as human beings, homo religious, we have the, the, the desire, we have the longing for transcendence, 
for freedom, for meaning in life. And that for Iliade, again, is a concrete manifestation or concrete proof that, that we are indeed religious persons, that we have indeed the, the this inherent, you know, religiosity uh, within us. In relation to these three categories, we may now mention that one of the primary objectives of Iliadis, the sacred and the profane, is to define the fundamental opposition between the sacred and the profane. Iliadi did this by showcasing the very perception of human mind towards the sacred and by categorizing persons into sacred or archaic beings. So for Iliade, uh, uh, the sacred uh, um, is the same with the archaic you know, being. And on the other hand, profane or modern beings. And so I want to emphasize this one because when, when you read um, Eliade's um, uh, works on religion, uh, he always use or you, you may encounter, you will in, definitely encounter the word modern or the modern, so modern being. And so when 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 Iliade used the word modern beings, he was referring to contemporary beings like us living today. And for Iliade, the sacred is, is and for Iliade, the sacred being is one who seeks, creates, and needs the sacred space in order to exist meaningfully, while the profane does not, while the profane being does not. So again, we are inherently religious, religious being because we have the tendency, we have this longing, we have this, uh, again, natural tendency to seek, create, and need a sacred space in order for us to exist meaningfully. Another intention of Iliade in introducing these three categories is to acquaint his readers with the idea of the nominals, as I explained. As, as I briefly mentioned a while ago. A concept, a concept provided in Rodolf Otto's The Idea of the Holy. And if you're familiar with Rodolf Otto, it's, um, um, oh, of course, one of the, the philosophers of religion, uh, one of the philosophers of religion who introduced the idea that um, the experience of something luminous, the experience of something mysterious, extraordinary, and supernatural, or or all inspiring event is an is an instance of you know religious experience. The nominous experience is that experience of the sacred, which is particular to religious human beings, in that it is experientially overwhelming, encompassing the mysterious tremendum et fascinans both the awesomely fearful and the enthralling, captivating aspects of the holy or the holy other. So it's a very basic in, in, in Rodolf Otto's uh, philosophy of religion. In expanding and expounding the phenomenological dimensions of the sacred, Eliade points out that the sacred appears in human experience as a crucial point of orientation. At the same time, it provides access to the ontological reality, which is its source and for which homo religiosus thirsts or longs for. As we can see for Eliade, the homo religiosus thirsts or longs for being, for meaning. So again and again, it is a natural tendency for us human beings, for us, uh, to long for a meaning in life. We are not yet satisfied with material things, or we can never be satisfied with, with material things like food, money, shelter. We also need spiritual satisfaction or or however you call it, maybe psychological or maybe some kind of self-fulfillment. But in, in, the, in the Christian sense, this is what Jesus Christ said when meant when he said that this is what Jesus Christ meant when he said that we do not live by bread alone. We also need the spirit. I'm not sure if, um, um, oh, well, um, um, I want to interpret that 
that way, this idea that way. And in terms of space, the sacred delineates the demarcation between the sacred and the profane, and thus locates the axis mundi as center. This is the reason why temples, churches, and other places became sacralized for, for, for homo religiouses. But since cosmogonic activities or worldly activities as were done in the beginning of human civilization are recapitulated periodically in rituals and myths, then for Eliade, it's not only space that has become sacralized, but time as well. Time could be sacred as well. Think, for example, of how the Sabbath has been sacralized in Jewish traditions. Now on the sacredness of nature and cosmic religion, just very, very briefly on, on this. Iliadi argues that nature is fraught with religious values. Yeah. Nature is not just nature only, but Iliad, for Iliad, nature is, is loaded with religious values. Hence, for Iliad, nature is never only natural. It must be noted that for Iliad, this sacrality is not simply based on a divine communication that has designated or designated it or consecrated it as sacred. But within nature are manifestations of the different modalities of the sacred in the very structure of the world and of cosmic phenomena. In other words, for Eliade, nature is sacred not because it is created by God, it is created by something extraordinary or a sacred being, but it is sacred because, or nature is, is sacred or is fraught with religious values because it contains within itself all those manifestations of being sacred, of sacrality, sacrality. Iliadi writes, the cosmos as a whole is an organism at once real, living and sacred. It simultaneously reveals the modality of being and of sacrality. Ontophany and hierophany meet. And as we can see, as Iliadi would have us believe, for the homo religiosus, the, super, the, the supernatural shines through the natural, that nature always expresses something that transcends it. So again, oh, of course, um, for the believer, the world is created by God, but this sacrality of nature does not depend on the idea that it is created by God. But nature within, oh, of course, within nature itself is the idea, the concrete manifestations of this sacrality. And so again, for the homo religiosus, the supernatural, the supernatural shines through the natural. But nature expresses something that transcends it. And very briefly, on aquatic symbolism is some. It is uh, uh, one of uh, the important concepts in uh, one of the important parts in in Eliade's the sacred and the profane. Iliadi turns to the discussion on, on aquatic symbolism as a rich source of religious symbolism. For Iliadi, the waters not only pre-exist to earth as in, Genesis, uh, as in the Genesis account, but water is one of the symbolisms through which a variety of religious experiences elucidate and make transparent the world and portray the transcendent. As Iliadi writes, the waters symbolize the universe or the universal sum of virtualities. They are fonts et origo, or spring and origin, the reservoir of all the possibilities of existence. They precede every form and support of support. Uh, they, they precede every form and support every creation. Lands, especially but not exclusively islands, emerge from the waters. Immersion causes the dissolution of forms. Water implies both death and rebirth. The flood, periodical submersion of the continents, such as in the Atlantis myth, baptism, and a variety of hylogonies, that is the formation of humanity from water, 
involve display and recapitulate temporary reincorporation into the indistinct followed by a new creation of life or new mind according to whether the moment involved is cosmic, biological, or soteriological. In fact, Iliadi points out in several examples that the fathers of the church did not fail to exploit certain pre-Christian and universal values of aquatic symbolism, although enriching them with new meanings connected with the historical existence of Christ, especially in the idea of baptism. It must be noted that for Iliade, symbols such as the aquatic symbol are pregnant with messages. Indeed, symbols show the sacred through the cosmic rhythms. Also, the symbolizations of Terra Mater or Mother Earth are replete and pregnant with symbolic implications. Mother Earth is the womb, nourisher, sustainer of life par excellence that draws hymns of praise and gratitude to the great and primordial world, but primordial mother worldwide. The symbolizations of Mother Earth also convey fecundity, generation, life, and abundance. For homo religious or for homo religiouses, the appearance of life is the central mystery of the world. Life comes from somewhere that is not this world and finally de depart from here and goes to the beyond. In some mysterious way, continuous in an unknown place, inaccessible to the majority of mortals. This explains why believers or religious people are convinced that death does not put a final end to life. Death for them is but another modality of human existence. And human existence and sanctified life, just very briefly, before I go to my final uh, remarks. It must be remembered that one of Iliade's primordial aims in the book is to understand and to make understandable to others religious persons' behavior and mental universe. Iliade contends that an existence open to the world is not an unconscious is not an unconscious existence buried in nature. Openness to the world enables religious person or religious person to know herself in knowing the world. And this knowledge is precious to her because it is religious, because it pertains to being for our souls. Iliade also contends that in the contemporary world, religion as a form of life and Weltanschauung or worldview is represented by Christianity. Now, Iliade believes that the whole of human existence is capable of sanctified and, not, and, and, and this must be noted. Again, I, I repeat, Iliade believes that the whole of human existence is capable of being sanctified. Of course, the means by which its sanctification is brought about are various, but the result is always the same. That is, life is lived on twofold plane. On the one hand, it takes its course as human existence and at the same time shares in a transhuman life, that of the cosmos or the gods. Indeed, homo religiosus lives in an open cosmos and is in turn open to the world. And for Eliade, this means that he is in communication with gods and second, he shares in the sanctity of the world. In other words, as religious beings, we are always in communication with God or with the gods. And second, that we share the sanctity of the world, that humans are sacred. And to my final remarks on this topic, On a final note, it must be emphasized that it is in the nature, it is 
in the nature of the human person as conscious being to create, as Iliadi puts it, a cosmos out of chaos. And when when we say when, when Iliadi used the word cosmos out of chaos here, Iliadi is saying order. He is referring to order out of chaos. So in other words, it is it is natural for humans like us, for religious people to create order out of chaos. Okay. We have the tendency to long for peace of mind, for example, happiness rather than suffering and, and other forms of debaucheries. The, inesc the, the inescapable human distinction between sacred and profane occurs when the human person attempts to ground herself in her world, to recognize both her own subjectivity and the subjective importance of the physical and temporal spaces she inhabits. Or in other words, we experience, we, th there is the binary opposition between the sacred and the profane, the moments we focus more on temporal things. Hence, where the profane rules, there is chaos. And I want to emphasize this one. Again, as I mentioned before, one of the main intentions of 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 Iliade in this book is for us to, for us to, to to believe for us to become religious people because again um we are inherently religious because when when we actualize our sacredness when we become religious people or when we attune ourselves to the sacred there is order there is peace of mind and so again according to Iliade where the profane rules there is chaos in a profane universe there are no values no distinctions but the notion of the sacred emerges with consciousness itself with the realization that this person, who I am, is not like everyone else, but it is me. And this space I, that, that I inhabit is not like other spaces, because it is the center of my world. And this time is not like other times, because it is the time I am experiencing right now. So... At the end of the day, even if one claims to have no formal religious beliefs, or even if one claims that he or she is an atheist, the sacred, profane distinction still makes itself known to him. Sure. Some places and times, like, neighborhood, like the neighborhoods of one's youth, or a memory of a first love have an extraordinary personal significance which elevates them, us, above the normal spectrum of space and time. Again and again, as I already mentioned many times, we cannot escape, we cannot avoid experiencing something luminous, something extraordinary. We cannot avoid thinking of the past influencing us. Religious customs from the most primitive to the most sophisticated are in essence an acting out of this sacralization of the world. And this sacralizing tendency is a fundament is fundamental to human nature as consciousness itself. And so at the end of the day, again, this sacralizing tendency is as fundamental to consciousness, to thinking. It's, according to Iliad, of course, you may not agree with him, but it's a necessary part of being human. 
And so, so much for my synthesis on this module on on the topic on on, on, on religious experience, and most particularly on on Mersha Iliadis, the sacred and the profane. Thank you very much for listening, and I wish you all the best. Good day.